I'm here to tell you about how genetics can tell you about our background. And I want to start with something that maybe you're all familiar with. Many of you may have given a blood donation, and you may know that you have to be typed, you have to be typed for your ABO type. So my first slide, you've almost certainly all given blood at some time. And you may have had your ABO types given, and they're shown here because if you type B, you have an anti-A, and that will cluff, uh, agglutinate and cause clusters of a type A person, and so on. Now, the ABO types actually were the first clear-cut genetic differences that were defined in human populations in the year 1900 by Landsteiner. And they formed the basis for, for the beginning of studies of genetic differences between populations. Because you could say, well, what are the frequencies of these genetic types in different populations? And what might they be able to tell us about those populations? So uh, around about the time of the First World War, a couple called the Hirschfelds, they had worked on the ABO types. And they took a, a group of different populations. You can see here the English, French, all the way down to Indians, Negroes, term we wouldn't use nowadays, Africans. And you can see that they were just typing A and B. You see an A and a B there. And the frequency of the A's is the hatched column, and the frequencies of the B's is the unhatched column. And you can see simply from these data that the frequency of the B's changed very much when you went from English and European populations to populations in other parts of the world, like Africa. Uh, uh, and, the, and the Far East. And actually Hirschfeld thought this was very interesting. He thought the world was divided into two types, the A types and the B types, which obviously now we know is a ridiculous idea because there are so many other genetic differences that we use to tell us about what's going on. But actually what they found using data from soldiers in the First World War was very close to what was found much later where here you see the shading. If it's dark, it's more B types. If it's light, it's less B types. Relatively few uh, in the UK and more here when you get to India and parts of, the, uh, of, the, of Asia. So this was telling you something about variation between populations. And an interesting, very, very early application of this at a time when far fewer genetic differences were known than we know now. This was actually applied to an interesting study uh, of the population of Wales. And some of you may know that there's a little area here called Little England Beyond Wales, which was settled by farmers that were put there by Henry II around uh, the 12th century, who had a different makeup of their ABO types from the rest of the Welsh population in which they'd settled. And they kept themselves apart from that. Uh, and Morgan Watkins, who did a, careful, did a careful study of the ABO types in Wales, showed that these people had a different frequency, in this case of the A type, uh, than the Bs, compared to the rest of the world. And that was a very early indication of how you might use even a single genetic difference to try and find out about something about where people came from. So uh, the question is how to take that further. Uh, and my colleague, Cavalli Sforza, with whom I did much work, and another colleague, Anthony Edwards, they took the blood groups that were known at one time, maybe just half a dozen different or so genetic differences. Then they said, can we look at the relationships between populations by how similar are their frequencies of these genetic types? And when they did this, using quite fancy statistics, they got to a, 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 the evolutionary theory of, British, of, of world populations that really, when you consider how little data they were using, was remarkably good with Australians, Native Australians, New Guinea, um, the, the Asian populations going all the way through uh, to the European and elsewhere. Uh, and it was a remarkable example that, uh, pre, that predicted what in the end it might be possible to do if you had more genetic information that you could use to look at these differences between different human groups living in different parts of the world.
And I just want to tell you about another set of differences that I've been very involved in in my own life, which you may have come across. You may know that if you have a, a, a bone marrow transplant or a kidney transplant, you have to be matched for much more than just the ABO types, because there are differences between almost all of us, which is such that when you give a foreign graft, it's recognized as foreign, just like an infection would be. And it's rejected by your immune system, which protects you from infections. And this system of types uh, is called HLA. And it's much more complicated. So each of these letters, A, B, C, etc., refers to a different gene, a different section of our genetic makeup. And each of the numbers refers to a different version of that gene. So there are many, many versions. There are now even many more than shown here, thousands. And it's a highly variable system. It has an interesting feature that all these genes, there are six illustrated here, occur very close together on our chromosomes. So they tend to be inherited together. And this is actually a picture of my family. So each of these symbols indicates the combination of genes that I've inherited from my father or my mother, uh, and that's uh, the types from my late wife, from whom the children come. So there are four possible combinations because they're all inherited together, and that's one of mine. So I have these six different types inherited from one of my parents. And when you combine those together, there are just four possibilities because they're all closely linked. And that's why with bone marrow transplants, you can match sibs, brothers and sisters, very well just by these HLA types to give an almost complete match. And that's why when you do that, you get very good survival of the bone marrow counts, although you do need uh, medicines to stop that. So in fact, this HLA system, before the days of DNA even, turned out to be very valuable in terms of studying population variation. And I want to tell you about another feature of it, which turns out to be very important in getting a more detailed and, and in-depth analysis of genetic differences. And that's because these types are inherited uh, together by closely linked genes, as we say. So if you're a type A1, and that's your frequency, and type B8, and that's your frequency, if they were independent, then the combination should be just the expected frequency of that times that, which is here. But what you find is much more than you would expect. You find this much more. And that's because those two types are held together uh, because they're closely linked. So you can take into account not only the individual variation, but how variation that is associated in the chromosome uh, is looked at together according to where it occurs on the chromosome. And that turns out to be really important when getting a finer analysis and why we talk about the fine structure. So I want to, and this system, just for interest of one of the reasons that the Wellcome Trust that supports a lot of human research supported us, was not just to find out about populations, but because what you find out has a relevance to looking at genetic uh, disposition to different diseases. Uh, an early work with the HLA system showed that here's so an ankylosing spondylitis, which is a sort of uh, aggravating form of, of rheumatism where your vertebrae stick together. Uh, and it turned out that people who have this ankylosing spondylitis, nearly all of them have this type B27, which can now be used essentially to help diagnosis, where in the normal population there's hardly any of them. Psoriasis of skin disease associated with this type much more than in the normal population. And celiac disease, gluten sensitivity, which you may be familiar with, similarly associated with this type much more than in the normal population. And also rheumatoid arthritis. And that's because this system of differences, HLA, uh, is, is not there just to aggravate uh, transplant surgeons, but it's there to protect us uh, from immunity, and it plays a clear, key role in the way we respond to infections, notably 
uh, the, for example, the coronavirus. It's very important to understand the mechanisms through which uh, we respond uh, and may become resistant to such infections. So with that background, I want to tell you now about our study, the people of the British Isles. And as I say, this was supported because it was felt that the data we would get on the British population would help people in studying the genetic basis uh, of disease susceptibility. So it was funded by the Wellcome Trust, uh, uh, as uh, I said, as a background to disease studies, but not studying diseases. We collected 4,000 or more samples, and we did this from rural areas because we wanted to get a representation of the British people as they were before most of the Industrial Revolution spread them all to different parts of the country and outside the cities to where people tended to go to. And we tried to get a better sample by taking people, all four of whose grandparents came from the same area, so that we were really sampling people who were representative of the part uh, of Great Britain where they came from. And we analysed at that time just over uh, 2,000 people. And uh, you're using DNA, I won't go into the DNA technology, but instead of using just one or tens, you can use hundreds of thousands of genetic differences at the DNA level, which give you a much better assessment of how different two groups of people are. And this fine structure does that by taking into account the differences you're looking at and where they're positioned and whether they tend to associate with each other in the analysis. So it's through that we created uh, what we call a genetic map of the British Isles, and that's what I'm going to tell you about uh, at, this, at this stage. Uh, for most of my talk, I'll tell you how, uh, we, what we found and how that relates to where we think the differences that we found came from. And uh, we, we, had, uh, we had, of course, to be careful in the way we recruited people. Uh, and we used a variety of ways of trying to get people who were interested essentially in where they came from. So they, they knew that, that they came from that area, they knew about their grandparents, we used the media, family history societies, all, all sorts of organizations. And we would go to different parts of the country and settle ourselves into a, a, a town hall or a, or a church hall uh, and put a sign up and get people to come uh, and give us samples. And we take blood samples because that's where we can get the, the DNA from. And so here's a picture of a typical gathering. This is actually my daughter. This is one of the key people who helped with it. Another one there. And there we are in a room and we've got a, that, that's my wife, my current wife, my first wife died, who was involved in discovering the HLA system. Uh, and we give them a questionnaire, find out about where they come from, uh, what their parents and grandparents' names were, and we take a blood sample so we can do the genetics. So what I'm going to tell you is, is what the results is are of that analysis. Now, uh, this indicates uh, where we got the samples from. So each spot there is the mean position of where the grandparents of the people who were sampling came from. So you might wonder why some of them are in the middle of the sea, but that's because some of them had parents that were their grandparents and there. And you can see roughly we cover uh, the, the, the whole of the British Isles pretty well, including Northern Ireland. We were not um, supported to cover Ireland because that's not part of what the Welcome Trust did. You can see a big gap here in London because we didn't sample from the cities. It looks sparse in, in Scotland, but that's because not many people live in those parts of Scotland. And you can see that's the Orkney Isles up there. And for various reasons, uh, we went there. I've been there about six or seven times now. And it's a lovely place to go to because they're an interesting population in their own right. So what do you do with these samples? You try and ask uh, how similar are people to each other. And you try and group them into groups that are similar based on the frequencies of these genetic types. Uh, and that's what we did and that's what this says. And uh, in the end you'll see pictures here with <coughs> different symbols, with different colors. And each of them relate to a cluster of people who've been shown to be more similar to each other genetically than they are to other groups, just by the frequencies of their genetic types. 
And that's what we call this fine structure analysis. And our original data was published first in 2015. Now, I want to show you first what happens if you don't take into account uh, of, of where people come from. Uh, you get a mess. So these are all the symbols for different groups that we found. Uh, that's, I think, South Wales and that's North Wales. They're quite different. Uh, but, but even the Orkney Islands don't stick out. So if you just do the classical analysis without taking into account of how genes are inherited together, you don't get much information. But if you do it properly, using um, this uh, indication of where genes lie, you get a picture like this. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is to interpret this for you, because it's really quite remarkable. So each symbol, whether it's a circle or a cross or a square with a different color, <laughs> relates to a group of people who, by the statistical analysis, were found to be more similar to each other than they are to any other group within the UK. And we plotted, we got that information uh, and the analysis of the similarity by genetics with no reference to where the people came from. And then we plotted uh, those groups onto the map of the British Isles. And the result is quite startling because the genetics seems to match with where they come from remarkably well. So here's Cornwall and Devon the rest of England, Wales, and you see different sets of symbols, Northern Ireland and Scotland and Auckland. Uh, and so it's really quite a remarkable result, and I want to go through this in a little detail to indicate what these relationships and differences really, really tell us about the British population. You can see that as a sort of, it's not so clear, as a sort of pedigree analysis where the Welsh populations are much more similar to each other as you'd expect the Orcadian populations where there were several differences and the rest of England also showing differences. So I'm going to take you through a step-by-step -step analysis which indicates, first of all, we can go back and say, which is the group that was most different from every, everything else? Anyone willing to have a guess at that? Any thoughts? Anyway, it should become obvious if you know the history uh, of the Orkney Islands because it's Orkney. Well, you can see that Orkney, that yellow spot there, is the most different from all the rest of the British Isles. And you might not be too surprised at that because Orkney was a Norse earldom for some four or five hundred years. And so there was an admixture of the Norse Vikings, as I'll come to say. So that was the biggest initial differences. Now you look each time I press the button for a new slide, see what colors come up. Well, before I do that, let's look at Orkney again. Now, many of you may know that surnames tend to be associated with certain parts of the UK. Uh, and there's a professor at University College who has a program called Surname Profiler, where you can look up your surname if it occurs at least 100 or 200 times in the UK and see where it was in about 1988 and where it was 100 years later. And that's what I'm showing you here to the surname Rendell. Now, if any of you have been to Orkney or know about it, you'll know that Rendell is a highly characteristic name uh, of, of the Orkney Islands and, uh, and the northeast part of Scotland. And if you go into the wonderful cathedral there, you'll see um, uh, gravestones uh, of, of Rendells uh, of the past. And you can see this purple shows that the main distribution in 1881 of a census there, of that surname, was just in Orkney and in that north and east part of uh, of, of the British Isles, with possibly uh, a small little bit there. And a hundred years later, it doesn't look much different, which is remarkable. It shows that when people actually don't move around all that much, and there's a stability even when you look at patterns of surnames. And we could take certain markers that, uh, in, in initial studies, and we could say that actually he was more similar to what we call the ancient British down here. But he had a particular Y chromosome type. The Y chromosome is what makes you a male, uh, if you are a male like me, and otherwise you're a female generally. So actually his Norse type came, uh, his Y chromosome type came from, the, uh, from Norway and was probably due to an admixture with, with, with some of the Norse Vikings. So now let's go to what was the next biggest difference. 
And here, if you look, we have that. And now what's different is Wales. And that was quite striking. I don't think we really would expect that. That after the Orkney Islands, the biggest difference you find is, is respect to the Welsh, which suggests that actually, and I'll come back and back to this several times, that maybe they represent the, the two most ancient aspects of, of the two British populations, of which, by the way, I'm a very poor example, only about an eighth of me is truly of British origin. And here again, there's a strong association with surnames. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Uh, one of our volunteers was David Hughes. Well, you couldn't think of a more Welsh name than David Hughes. If you look at the distribution of the name Hughes, surname Hughes, in 1881, you can see the purple is the highest and it's spread in North Wales, a little bit to the rest of Wales. And a hundred years later, it looks hardly any different. It's spread out a little bit more. And in that case, again, we could use some of our initial work markers. And from those, if we just looked at his uh, genetic makeup, he was some 20 times more likely to be Welsh than Anglo-Saxon. So that sort of fitted in with the fact uh, of, of the differences between the Welsh and the rest of the populations. Now, let's look what happens when you go further. You'll see that now, North and South Wales are separated. They're quite different relative to others. You see also that Northern Ireland and Northern England and Scotland come together as separate from the rest. And here's Cornwall sticking out uh, on its own. Uh, and uh, th these differences correspond to Gwyneth and, and the uh, North and South, different populations of Wales as we know them now. So they've been preserved. Uh, as have those surname differences over quite long periods of time. So you're beginning to get a picture of the structure of these different populations. And as I go again here, you'll begin to see that we begin to see differences between the Northern Irish and the Scottish and the Northern English, which you'd expect. Uh, and they're coming up now. Remember, each time the group that's similar is more similar within it, within the group than it is to the rest of the others. So you're picking out new groups that are similar within previous groups where there were not those differences. And then if you go to the next one, um, here you'd see something that's quite remarkable. Just look down here. Cornwall and Devon. Uh, and you may not know the map that well the way I do. I've got a, somewhere where I go on holiday just about here. That's the real dividing line geographically, quite precisely, between Cornwall and Devon. And look how there's hardly any overlap in the genetics. The genetics separates almost entirely the people from Cornwall, from Devon. Now, these are statistical differences. Um, so they're, they're quite small, but they're enough to indicate that there's some element of difference in the genetic makeup of those two populations. <coughs> Which, which fits with what we know historically. And here you're beginning to see populations on the border, the Welsh borders, which are reflecting uh, the intermarriage of the difference between the Welsh and, and the rest of the UK. And you're also beginning to see, which was one of the first observations we had, that even within Orkney, you're seeing differences between uh, West Day at, uh, and the places of the north uh, uh, and the southern parts of, of the Orkney Islands. So what, what happens next? Now here you see something, if you look carefully, here we, we, you saw that difference there. Here you can see a difference appearing in South Wales. And we believe, and I'll come back to that, that that's that same difference that was shown just by looking at the ABO types. The difference between the farmers that were settled uh, in, in the times just after the Norman Conquest and kept themselves to themselves and still, to some extent, uh, speak their own language and don't speak Welsh, and kept themselves separate from the rest of the population. So you're gradually building up this picture and you also see a group here in Scotland that is separate from the group that associates Northern Ireland with the rest of, of Scotland. And let's see what the next one is. I think that's... <coughs> 
And that's, that's the, and the last one that makes any sense. If you go too far in this, you start splitting, up, splitting people's groups into too small uh, groups. So here you can see with, there are 17 different groups. You can, the uh, Cornwall and Devon, you've got the Northern <laughs> Wales, you've got the um, uh, Welsh borders separated. You've started to separate uh, the northwest and the northeast of England. You've got a separate group that associates some of the Irish with the north of Scotland and some with further south in Scotland. And you've got more differences there. So you can see these differences and you can begin to ask, well, how do they relate? Where do they come from? How do they relate to what we know about the history? We've already said something about that in relation to Orkney and the invasion by the Norse Vikings. And to do that, we've got to think about, well, what do we know about the history of the British Isles? And it's actually, in some ways, relatively simple. The last ice age stopped about 12,000 years ago. And although there were modern human remains found uh, on the British Isles that date back probably as far as 30,000 years, it's quite clear that they didn't survive the ice age that, that followed that. And so you don't have first settlers that stayed uh, that are less than about 12,000 years ago. And you have to remem remember that 12,000 years ago there was no British Channel. Uh, there was a landmass that separated uh, the main part of Europe, that didn't separate, that joined the main part of Europe with the British Isles. So it was easier uh, to move from one to the other. The next big item was the arrival of agriculture which came about 6,000 years ago. Then the Roman invasions, they didn't bring much in the way of genetic input because they tend to keep to themselves. And by that time, the population was large enough so the contribution from the Romans was not large. Then the Saxon settlements, which of course were very important. And then the Viking migrations. And finally, the Norman invasion, um, which brought very little in the way of genetics as we know. And that's the last time there was a really successful land invasion uh, of the British Isles. And we've gone on our own way since then without major invasions, but of course with uh, major migration groups. So let's just think about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, there's the land connection that you had before the Ice Age. Uh, and, then, and that's when the first settlers came. Then when the Romans came, you see, they occupied an area like this, which actually corresponds to one of the largest genetically similar groups I've described. And, and they didn't get very far west, which is why you find less difference uh, between this part of Britain and, and Devon and Cornwall. And they didn't get very far up north either. So you were left with the Picts and the Irish and the others, relatively little influenced by the Roman invasion. But then the next set of invasions is the one that really contributes most to what we see now. You first of all had the Anglo-Saxon invasions that came from people in the Danish peninsula here and the northern part of Europe, you know, France and Holland and those areas. And they settled uh, in, in the area that we think of as the Danelog out there. And again, they didn't penetrate all that far there. So there were, there were populations that were not that influenced by the Saxon, Saxon invasions. But then when the Norse Vikings came, they were the ones who occupied uh, the Orkney Islands for nearly 500 years. They came down, uh, down here, they settled in Ireland and other parts there. They came very little to the south. You have to remember that the Danes, actually, uh, the Danish Vikings, were the origin of the Normans. So that's a picture. So the question is, how can we relate that picture of what we know to what we found in the genetics. And the way to do that is to see if we can relate the genetics of the European populations that surround the British Isles with those with the British Isles. So that's what we did. And in order to do that, you have to have a study of the other European populations. And we were fortunate that we had colleagues that had done a large study on multiple sclerosis, and they had some 6,000 samples from different parts of Europe that were analysed in the same way that we'd done uh, the analysis of the British populations. And you can see that these circles, I know you probably can't read it, but these sectors uh, uh, reflect the different groups that we found that were similar to each other, 
the way we found British groups were. So you find a group here, you can't read it in problem, it's 31. And you find it down here, and it overlaps with Spain from the south of France. And you find a, a group 11 here that was found along here. Uh, but then you find other groups in Germany and Poland and Italy that are quite separate and are not, not found up here uh, and show quite remarkable differences between North and South Italy, uh, in fact, between the different Scandinavian countries. So you can take the genetic data from those, where there are some 51 groups that were identified as different, and see how do they contribute? How can we make up the British genetic groups in terms of combinations of these European ones? Uh, and uh, you use a bit of fancy statistics to do that um, and represent each of those British clusters as a mixture of European clusters. But when you do that, you find that out of the 51 different European clusters, the only ones that seem to matter were about nine of them reflecting the populations essentially around the fringes, fringes of Europe that face toward the British Isles. So I want to give you um, the results of what was found. And I just want to remind you again what we're talking about. We're talking about these 17 groups indicated by these different color symbols and shape and size. And we're saying how are each of them represented by a mixture of those nine different European groups. And the results, I think, are really quite stacking and, of course, begin to tell you a lot about what's happened. And let's look first at the Norwegian contribution. The Norwegian contribution, uh, in each of these circles is a sector where the different colors reflect the percentage of the different European population that contributed to that which is one of the Orkney populations. And those are the three Orkney groups, and you can see they each have a very large component, about 25% of their makeup can be represented by the, uh, by the Norwegian contribution, which you could say represents the Norse Viking input. And then if you go down here, you can see Northern Ireland has, um, has quite a reasonable contribution, uh, northwest of Scotland. And as you go down the country, that blue sector gets less and less, because the influence of the Norse Vikings became less and less when you moved away from the places to which they migrated. Now I want you to look at another. Remember that the Welsh populations stood out as the most different, apart from Orkney, from the rest. And you can see they're quite different. They have a different mixture of these green types. And they have none of the red. And they're quite distinctive from the rest of the British populations. And if you look at those green types, they come from where you'd expect, from France and the northwest of France, uh, the northwest of Germany, and to some extent from Belgium. And then when you look here, uh, and you look at this main big British group that we think relates probably ultimately to the main influence that the Romans had when they settled Britain, you can see this large red sector. These two, which are very large in the Welsh, are much less, very little from the Norse, and a bit of pink here, which begins to reflect where the Saxons came from and came in there. And if you look at the difference between, even between here, between Cornwall and Devon, you can see that there are just slight differences here. The frequencies of the yellow component, which are the Belgians, that, that really reflect why we can distinguish the Cornish uh, from, the, from the Devon populations. So you get quite a, a remarkable relationship between what you might expect in some ways from the patterns of migration uh, and what the genetics tells you. Now, all of these differences, as I've mentioned, are quite small, but they can be enough to tell you quite a lot about where someone comes from. Uh, and, and we had a sample uh, that came from Blackburn. Now, if all of you, I don't know how well you know the British geography of Blackburn. I was brought up in Manchester, and I know Blackburn's a town just north of Manchester. But this sample didn't come from there. It came from up here somewhere. And it turns out there's a Blackburn there too. So actually the genetics told us that the geographical assignment we'd made was wrong. And when we looked at the paperwork, that agreed with it. So you can find genetic differences here 
that are enough to say something about where a person may, may well have, have come from. And I think there are a number of features uh, of, of these data which are of interest. First of all, they indicate much more stability uh, of the population than you might think, which was already shown um, by, uh, uh, by the uh, data uh, on the surnames. And that's uh, quite, quite striking. Um, so, but they, they also show that you don't have a very obvious Celtic fringe, which everybody thinks about. If it's uh, represented at all, it's represented by these main components of the Welsh. And everything indicates that the Welsh populations probably reflect the nearest we have nowadays to populations that existed there before agriculture um, and, and before uh, the Roman and the Anglo-Saxon and the other invasions. But there's a puzzle about this red con contribution here, which is everywhere except in Wales. And actually what that suggests, we believe, is that there was quite extensive exchange between the continent of Europe, the north uh, and northwestern coast, and the British Isles. How much longer do you think? Uh, it's going to take me a bit longer. Another quarter of an hour or so? Okay. Okay. Um, because I think the most interesting part, to some extent, is in the end. Anyway, I'll try and be a bit quicker. Any, anyway, it, 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 uh, it, it suggests a migration that hasn't usually been talked about, um, which is well described by um, Barry Cunliffe, one of the great archaeologists uh, with whom we got a lot of advice, who pointed out that there was this area that connected uh, the British Isles with you know, over the time over which there was a lot of movement uh, like that. Well, um, I just want to say briefly a little bit about Ireland, uh, which has been studied separately by colleagues. Uh, and here you see a similar breakdown. I just want to point out one or two things. There's a lot of association of Northern Irish populations with the Scottish, which I've already defined. But if you go, you can't quite see it. These purple signs in, in, in Ulster associate much more strongly uh, with, with the rest of Ireland. Um, and you'll also notice that when you look at the sort of diagram that asks, well, how similar are the Irish to the other parts of Britain? The Irish population seem to be very similar to Orkney. Uh, and the reason for that is shown in the next slide, which is an analysis of the relative contributions of different population groups. And if you look at this side, you've got Orkney here. Uh, and again, you've got uh, a major contribution here from Norway, an important contribution here uh, relatively, the Norway contribution is the main one. And you can see that the Irish contribution is similar in size, uh, the Norse contribution to, to the contribution to the Orkneys. And that's why there's so much similarity between Ireland and Orkneys. And as you go in this direction, you see things in lesser contribution of the Norwegian populations and more with some of the um, Western European populations, just as we found in the British samples. Now, I want just in the last part to say something about what can we say um, uh, about uh, ancient populations. Uh, and I show this slide to point out to you that agriculture came about 6,000 years ago, and it probably came to Britain from two directions, from the Aegean moving down the Atlantic coast and from the Middle East and the Fertile Crescent, where it's often assumed, are coming across Europe, possibly two different sources. And that there was a later group where there's evidence of an input from the so-called beaker populations that came from areas like, like this, uh, and they came much later, about 1,500 years later. So people have studied ancient DNA. Now with the technology, you can take little bits out of where the teeth were and get a, a reasonable characterization of the genetics of people who, uh, you know, whose skeletons have been found um, some few thousand years ago. Uh, and this has led to uh, a controversial suggestion that I mentioned in these two papers, which, which made the suggestion that if you look at the affinities with the Neolithic populations, 
and with the later beaker populations, they suggested that they completely replaced the existing population in the UK at that time, which seems unlikely that the immigrants could be so overwhelming uh, it happened in a way in the United States, if you kill off all the local people, either by killing them or by disease, then of course you get an excess of the immigrants. But it seems unlikely that that was the real uh, explanation for that. Um, and so uh, the question is, what can one say about that from some of the data? So uh, my last slide, but it takes a little while to explain, uh, looks into that. Many of you may be familiar with the fact that there's a huge population study of the British that's been taken place that's called uh, Gene Bank, where half a million people have been sampled through their GPs, not selecting them from where they came from uh, uh, in any other way. Uh, and they've been studied for their genetics, but they've been mainly studied because of the contribution they can give to understanding genetic susceptibility to disease. And, and you can separate those populations, and these are two examples of how you can separate them. Um, and, and the different colors represent uh, different population groups. I, I think that these are the, uh, what the these are the, um, I think these are the two Welsh populations. You, you get uh, the, the various population groups that, that we've, we found in, in our study in, in the UK. Uh, and uh, so that, and then when you plot the British POBE samples against that background, it fits so that the North Wales and the South Wales are these red and yellow spots there, here and here. Uh, and the purple spots are, uh, are north of England and the green spots are Scotland. So you fit very well the structure that's found in those half a million people, uh, which is not in as much detail, fits well into the structure we found in our population. So what then happens when you look uh, at some ancient DNA samples? Uh, and these are, again, examples. So these are Neolithic farmers that came from the Anatolian area. These are Mesolithic Middle European. These are the people that came from, uh, from the steppes. And these are the Saxons. And it's only this group, these Neolithic farmers, that seem to be out with the population distribution of the British. And, and, and the rest all fit. So I, I think that the, these data suggest that this idea of complete replacement is almost certainly wrong. Uh, and that actually when you sample these ancient populations, you've got to be very careful of the nature of the samples you've drawn. And they're mostly from graves. And graves, uh, especially um, you know, notable grave uh, cemeteries, uh, often relate to the more elite part of a population. So it seems likely that actually the samples that were taken were not truly representative of the populations where the people came from. And that's an important consideration. So it seems unlikely that there were really these major replacements, which is unlikely because by the time the Beaker populations came um, in 2000, about 4,000 years ago, uh, it had already been 1,500 years or more since agriculture, and you'd had an increase in the population size. So it was very unlikely that a new population would completely change what was there. And it was even more unlikely when you found that that population didn't match what we find now. So basically, that's my story about how you can say something about the variety uh, of genetic differences in different British groups uh, which relate to their geography, geography, which relate to what we know about the history, and say a little bit about how this relates back in time uh, to ancient DNA studies. So I'd better stop there. I think I'm already over time. So thank you. <laughs>